Hey guys, um, we're just giving a few more minutes for people to uh, join the stream here. Um, like the description and we promised we're going to be doing um, a live sculpting demo on the creature foot. Right now it is blocked in to about 80-85%. Um, the other one is complete and we're going to use that as our model for symmetry and matching everything up. But we're trying to get, um, basically we want the two of them to look the same. Um, so that's why we haven't molded the first one yet. So we're just going to be referring to the first one. Um, and we can also show you step by step as we go what we're trying to do and the techniques that we use to get there. So right now as you can see, we have, um, there are rough spots and that sort of, you know, stuff that we'll have to clean up. We're going to keep referring to the finished foot as well. Um, because we want them to look like they're from the same creature. So I'll explain as we go along what tools we're going to be using and how we're going to be going about it. There's nothing special about the tools that we have. For the larger, um, broader sculpt um, on this, and this is monster clay, um, but we're going to be using standard Kemper wire tools. These are all available from um, most sculpture houses and uh, pottery houses, um, knives. These are a little bit different. They're ribbon tools. They cut a little bit more efficiently and we have a round and a square end on that one. Um, a lot of um, wooden tools. Um, they're for smoothing for the most part and um, defining areas. Uh, another wooden tool with a ribbon end. Again, the difference between the ribbon is this one's kind of a chiseled point edge and this one is just a rounded wire. So it helps with removing material quickly and efficiently. And then we also have some other finer tools. Um, this is a rake, but it's a fine rake. Um, it's got a larger and a smaller end. It's kind of like a guitar wire. And this one's a good tool as well. It's a, um, a ribbon tool, but it's much more pointed and round, so we can also get into areas that we can't with other tools. And then a fine line tool. This one is by one of our sponsors, uh, Cutting Edge Sculpture. So if you're on social media or on the web, look up Cutting Edge Sculpture. Um, excellent tools, excellent tools. And then again, some more uh, wire tools from Kemper. And this one, long ago, the end broke off, but it's a really great end. It's got almost like a mini uh, smoothing edge. It's kind of like the larger one, but gives you more definition. So if you're getting into smaller areas, it works a lot better. We'll probably take a couple of breaks throughout the day, but for the most part, you'll be able to join us in for all of the little steps that we do here. So basically what I'm looking at first off is going to be the general footprint. I want to make sure that the footprint itself is where we need it to be. So I'm just looking back and forth here and Aside from little tiny things I'm not going to nitpick on yet, it's pretty much where I want it to be. So we'll go ahead and start with um, the top section here, the bones of the, of the feet. These two sections here, they're very much like a skeleton almost, but it's, it's more like a, a crustacean. You know, if you ever looked at a crab leg or something like that, it kind of has a lot of the same features. Um, so what we're going to be doing is basically just refining based on our other foot because we want to make sure that our symmetry is good between the feet. So, again, this is monster clay. I, I like using monster clay because it's, uh, you know, it's a firm wax, um, very similar to Chavant. Uh, the NSP or NSP medium. But this is, um, we're going to need some clay as well. It also melts down to liquid pretty easy. And the reason I like Monster Makers uh, Monster Clay is because it is so versatile. A lot of times I won't use it on, say, a prosthetic when I'm building up a prosthetic sculpt. Um, 
because I found that the edge of the monster clay is very um, almost because it's waxy and it doesn't have the the stick that um, you know some of the other clays, especially the Chevant. It um, I don't know. It tends to kind of peel up from the edges, and you can't get a really clear, uh, defined feathered edge on prosthetics. But for stuff like this and busts. It's pretty much all I, all I use. And sometimes it seems with this stuff that you're, you're adding so slowly. And that's exactly um, what you got to do sometimes because a little change can have a big impact. And just so you know, we're broadcasting live. This is our first show on uh, Facebook Live. I mean, I'm sorry, um, YouTube Live. But trying to get the, the most reach we can out of this. And if you can see on this, what I'm doing is I'm trying to match this to the other sculpt. So I'm actually looking on the opposite side of the other foot that we've already completed here so I can get this symmetrical. Um, you know, as you're blocking it in, you kind of miss certain things that um, you know, because you're only getting it about 85% or so, but you're missing certain things or kind of going quickly over things just to get it blocked in the general shape and contours and all of your subforms. So you have to go back in at that point when you're happy with the overall blocking and detail it. So that's where we are on this now. And I wish we would have done that on the on the creature mask so you could have seen how those details come about but mm, I honestly didn't think that there would be that much interest in just the creation of the mask and the sculpting of the mask but I got yelled at by quite a few people that they missed out on seeing how that came about so that's why we're doing this series now at least from here on out, especially once we get to the suit, you guys will be able to see the whole process from there on. And if you have any questions, I'm shooting clay all over the place. If you have any questions, um, you can ask questions on um, the YouTube Live as well. Well, RJ's watching. Hello, RJ. RJ is the, for those that don't know, is the kilted, the kilted creature. He's our... Well, it uh, doesn't say RJ's watching, it says the kilted creature's watching. But. Well, I should say, oh. kilted creature's friend is RJ. We just, we just got to spend the weekend with him at uh, another type of celebration of the creature. Out at the Corazon Theater, we had a triple header that we were invited to. We had a blast. And it is an annual thing, so next year um, I know that the plans are already underway for another triple header coming up. But there were vendors and fans of the creature, the, um, the Ghostbusters were out there, and then... Middleburg Ghostbusters. Middleburg? Yes. Ancient Ancient City. City. Ancient City Ghostbusters. So, we did a lot of cool stuff. It was really, really a great time. We got chauffeured by a Ghostbusters great. Yeah, we got to do a ghost tour with the Ghostbusters, which was really Riding fun. Everyone. Riding, yes. Amber and I. Amber's behind the screen. She's the producer for the day. So, she's having fun. But yeah, we got to ride with the Ancient City Ghostbusters instead of on the regular trolley. And that was funny because they kept saying, you know, you sure you don't want to ride in the train? You don't want to... It's like, no, we're good. We're, we're riding with the Ghostbusters. We had a blast. But yeah, check out Kilted Creature on Facebook and his YouTube videos and pretty much anywhere your social media is sold. You'll find the Kilted Creature if you look it up. Some great stuff. You know, when I first found out about what RJ did, 
you know, I usually when I go to a show, I'm trapped at the tables and stuff. So I didn't get to meet RJ until I started working on this Gilibration suit and started posting pictures of the of the mask because he was like, oh, I love that. You know, how can I help? And, you know, there have been a few people that have really, really helped out with this project. And he was one of them and been very supportive. He and his wonderful wife, Cindy, has have been at the front of, you know, getting it out there that we're doing this and reposting. So thank you, RJ and Cindy, for everything you've done. <clears throat> Wouldn't be a live stream if I didn't give a shout out to my friend Gene Crowell as well who gave a lot of reference photos, some I've never even seen before. And uh, he gave us some really great shots that aren't so widely available. But, you know, when you've been... took the time to sit and watch the movie and take screen caps of things that we, you just can't find. Them. Oh, yeah, I mean... Yeah, I mean, literally... You know, I'd be working on a certain area and he would go and take screen caps or find images and say, you know, I think you need to work on this area or maybe um, make this a little more rounded or, you know, we had great debates on the lip position and, you know, it seems that from the original sculpt to what actually appeared, there may have been some mold anomalies that caused different shapes than what it was originally sculpted with. So that was kind of cool to kind of go back in history and, you know, see all these little anomalies. You can actually, if you want to move that box of clay, we can see the foot behind there and you can kind of show, point out where you're working at on the foot there. How's that? And we'll just show where you're working at to create the symmetry from the other foot to this foot. Yeah, this area in here that I'm building up, this is like some sort of... Um, I don't even know what that would be. They're just some simple subforms that they added in, probably just to make it look interesting. I'm not sure, but um, that's the area that we're that we're focusing on, and we're just worried about getting that symmetry right. And you know, if you've never taken the time, and this is where the education comes in, um, you think you know something after after seeing it for years and years and years okay i mean it i i first saw creature from the black lagoon when i was maybe in my you know i was maybe five six years old when they started showing it on creature features and you know all the different late night monster fests and that sort of thing and i thought i know i, I thought i knew what he looked like you know i had the action figures, the toys, movie posters, all sorts of stuff like that. But I did not really know the creature until I started breaking it down when I was doing this sculpture. Because then you see all these interesting things that ordinarily you would take for granted. So it's been a real education to kind of unlearn what I thought I knew about the creature and you know, get something that was as close to the original as possible. Because this is a celebration. This is going to be for the Gilbration. For those that you, of you that don't know, please look up our information on Facebook and the website for Hearts of Reality and Give Kids the World. This is for the Gilbration, and it is a celebration of the 65th anniversary of Creature from the Black Lagoon. So... This is kind of one of those once-in-a-lifetime things. We're going to be celebrating the life and work of Rico Browning. Um, we're going to be wanting to induct him into a, a, a Hall of Fame as such. We're also working on getting Ginger Stanley, the stunt swimmer for Julie Adams. Julie's no longer with us, and it's, it's kind of sad because we really envisioned that this would be an event that she would be at because she's been such a friend to the creature and over the years you'd see her at shows and you know get to know her and hear her stories and it was a great time in history for those of you that weren't a part of it and couldn't be there to hear her stories and back when uh, G, uh, uh, Ben Chapman was still alive 
and we got to hear his stories and Rico's stories and unfortunately these greats these people that brought us so much entertainment they're getting older and I don't want to say they're forgotten because nobody is ever going to forget the impact that they had on cinema but you know they're 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 aged and rather than eulogize them we want to celebrate their lives we want to celebrate who they were what they contributed to the monster kingdom and yes that's a term monster kid if you look up what a monster kid is I'm sure if you're tuned into this channel first of all you're probably a monster kid already but um, it is someone that was born from late 60s I would say is the accepted you know maybe maybe early 60s to about 76 um, but really any time in there is when they did a real they called them real art re-releases but they offered packages and syndication for movies to come back out and Gilman came out in 54 he was one of the late comers to the party when you consider that a lot of the other uh, monsters like Frankenstein, Dracula, they came out in 31, and you had before that in the 20s, you had the work. The average monster kid may have been born in those years, but I think we created some. Oh, yeah. And I wasn't born in those years, and I love my monsters. It's really just anyone who's an absolute fan of monsters. It's really just anybody who has absolute love and adoration for the classics. Yeah, yeah. And, and these are classics. I mean, they're you figure that people think classics nowadays could actually be interpreted as you know the Nightmare on Elm Street from the 80s or whatever because you know let's face it those are well they're considered vintage because more than 25 years old they could get a vintage plate at the DMV yes <laughs> that's true but it's like it's a different thing and, and don't get me wrong I love I love the horror of you know, the 80s, you know, especially like Nightmare on Elm Street and stuff like that. It's great memories and, and it was kind of a dawning of a new type of special effects and makeup. And a new type of monster that was a little more cerebral. It wasn't as in your face like, oh, it's a real monster right here. Oh, yeah. It was very psychological then. Especially with Freddy because that, that was so... It was a of your imagination and you were stuck with it. Yeah, yeah, and it's psychological and visceral, and, you know, I'm going to probably tick off a lot of people, but our, our four-year-old, soon to be five, she grew up on this stuff, because I've been, you know, around... She's a monster kid. She sleeps with Dracula and the Wolfman in the bed. Yep, Dracula. And she also has a Freddy Krueger and a leather face and Demogorgon and a two-headed baby and a two-bodied baby. And she is not your typical child though. <laughs> yeah and she appreciates the classic of the original television miniseries and then she also loves you know the uh, latter day it that's uh, actually a part two just dropped their trailer um, what I'm going to be working on now is in here I'm not really happy entirely with the way that it wound up on the other one is much better I think so I'm going to wind up um, kind of blending those two into a and a good thing to point out when you're when you're doing when you're wanting to consider symmetry the best way to do that is to measure I like kind of faking it with math you know um, but you know when your numbers don't lie so when you're trying to reach that symmetry the best thing you can do is go by the numbers you know your eye is only going to catch so many things so we do employ tricks like you know measuring and and using calipers for symmetry <clears throat> for something like this and and this isn't like something that that is probably a real term but you know I always consider that there's mechanical symmetry and then there's organic symmetry um, mechanical symmetry is like what you would expect from say Iron Man's armor 
you can sculpt it or sculpt a car but you know if you're looking for actual symmetry um, in something mechanical tools like calipers measuring tapes all that sort of thing they're very very necessary um, because you're looking for that complete symmetry um, organic symmetry is a little bit different and that's what we're going for here this is an organic symmetry um, something that was alive something that breathed something that had nicks and battle damage and lost toenails and stuff like that so it's a little bit different and I don't mind a little bit of asymmetry natural asymmetry because if you look at people's faces you'll see that they're not completely symmetrical left to right <laughs> yeah, and you can look at someone and oftentimes, you know, like if you're working with toy companies, they want symmetry, but at the cost of what? You kind of lose likeness when you spend so much time on symmetry. Um, one of the most, for those Star Wars fans out there, I know there are some of us, um, you remember like when the original trilogy came out? Darth Vader. Very famous suit, right? Um, arguably one of the greatest designs for uh, a bad guy in, in cinema for quite some time. And you look at the helmet, and the more you study it, the more you're like, holy crap, that thing is way off. It had what was called a, a slop cheek or a drop cheek one of the cheeks kind of drops down a little bit at a different angle and you look at um, I believe it was even like the neck where the neck uh, the neck pieces the bib of or the lower jaw of the costume that was even different from side to side there was a different bend to it the way the eyes were all of that stuff and you don't really realize it until you look at it or try to replicate it Oh yeah, because yeah, they, you know, they filmed this in in the 70s, 75, 76, <clears throat> and um, when they did, optics weren't the best. It was just shot on, I believe, 70 millimeter film, and you know they had to pop out certain areas of the mask, so they actually painted it silver, like a gunmetal color. Um, not so much on the first one, it was a little bit you could see, but by Empire, they really took advantage of that. And, um, you know, you could tell a little bit more about the contours. And then came his first appearance in the prequels, and that was kind of a bittersweet thing, because here we saw the origin, the birth of Darth Vader... But they changed the, the mask, and they put it into a computer, and they reworked the symmetry. They mirrored from left to right, and it lost so much of the character. And I know that's weird that you think, oh, well, there was expression in that, in that mask, but there really was. You know, it, it was beautiful. It was a more tragic. Yeah. It was beautiful in its asymmetry, and part of that was because when they originally sculpted it, they had, I think the rumor, or the, the urban legend is, the guy that sculpted that had like two weeks or something, something crazy to come up with a, a sculpt, and then it went immediately over to Rick Baker's studio where he molded it, and the rest is history. So... Right now, we're still just focusing on getting, you know, more of those forms in this foot. That's why I'm kind of spending a little bit of time on this little, this little fin area. We'll come back in and do more work, but especially like under here, I want this to all be, you know, very organic like that one is. So we're going to just push this clay around to where it looks like this guy could walk. Yeah, and you figure this thing, if it were in reality, 
you know we'd probably have a field day playing with all the little subtleties like he'd probably have seaweed stuck between his toes and Sand. dirt but that we can do some of that in paint but you see like I, I don't know if you can see in here like between the toenail of the dew claw and this crustacean looking segment but right in here is where we can add a lot of of reality now in truth who is going to be looking down there because this is for a suit that someone's going to wear um down at gilibration and who's going to be studying it that much but you know to a certain degree we're in a high def world and i don't want people to look down in there and and not get a fitting tribute to the original artists and designers because you know they may not and there's a lot of in, uh, just little intrinsic details that they put into this Millicent Patrick and the primary sculptor um, Chris Muller if you listen to their stories and everything God they put a lot of detail into this suit that most people probably wouldn't see or appreciate but by today's standards it was um, it's still an amazing suit even today so we're wanting to add some of that life into the into the suit but all of the angles and dimensions we want to keep as close as possible to the original because this we want to be a fitting love letter to the whole series everything from the actors <clears throat> to the people that created it, the writers. Oh. I'm make this. I think we could go up a little bit more. How do you make it go up more? This turns. We're just changing our camera angle. That's fine. Maybe that'll help you be able to see more. And no, again, I just want to see over your hand. Let us know if you have any comments on this. And the YouTube Live does have the commenting. It's turned on, so you guys can ask questions. Please feel free. And the reason we are doing this on Facebook is on YouTube. On YouTube. Uh, we have done most of our stuff on the Facebook Live app. And we want to increase our reach on this because we're getting close. I mean, the event is September 14th, so yeah, the next few weeks are going to be nuts <coughs> as far as getting... Oh, Bruce said, Bruce um, says, love you guys, preach and Scott, teach the lineage of your craft. I love Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah, Bruce and I go way back and I love that man and his wife Joy Talk about symmetry on that book we made yes Actually, that may be... Was it Bruce uh, Rothschild or... Yeah. Okay. Wanted to make sure I was talking about the right Bruce. Yeah. If you weren't, I would have corrected you. <laughs> there's another good friend of mine. Unless there's another Bruce from your backyard superstore. No. <laughs> no, that's... He is the one and only. I do have another friend, Bruce Miller. Um, well, that's not the one I'm talking about. I'm talking about Arkham, the one I know. Of. Yes. But yeah, we we go way back. He's always been a good friend, very supportive of our studio work. He and his wife. Okay, so we have the sub forms in here. Don't worry about the roughness of the sculpt at this point because I'm going to show you all sorts of tricks when we get closer to the uh, end of the sculpt. 
and just to kind of give you a preview, a uh, stupid little chip brush, you know, 50 cent chip brush, or this. It's actually a makeup um, sponge, but they have this in, um, I think we got this one at, at Ross or something like that, Tuesday or morning. Tuesday morning, but you can get this from most beauty supply shops. I'll show you another cool little trick. You know the, uh, the 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 hair things. This was actually from Walmart, but you put bun. your hair through it and pull it through, and then That's you have a bun Walmart. thing. That's from the Dollar Tree. The Dollar Tree, yeah, they do have it too. Walmart, but I use this for smoothing things out. So when we get to that, that's where it really takes on a life of its own because you actually can get your brush in there and, and detail things out. So there's a lot that we're going to do during the course of this. And in replay, you're probably going to come back and, you know, be able to refer to certain techniques and apply them to other things that you might be sculpting, whether it's a, a lifelike sculpt um, portrait or, you know, something more horrific or alien-like. Techniques are just that. They can be modified for the job. Getting back to Bruce's um, other passion, um, I do want to share this because we've been associated with this group for quite some time, but the World Sports Alumni and believe me, I was always the artist nerd. I never, uh, and until they absolutely needed me in soccer in my high school because they couldn't even compete if they didn't have that extra man. So I was that, that space filler. Um, that was my big uh, moment in, in sports. I was the stats nerd. I, I sat on the sidelines and did sat stats for most of the the um you know my sports experience until i played in soccer um so you would imagine my surprise when bruce said i want you to join the world sports alumni and there are you know golfers and boxers and football bruce himself is a football alum so i'm like how do i fit into this and then there's an entertainment division and bruce started this up with the intent that um you know, things like that we would do for charities and take part in certain events. And he has kind of opened up a whole new world with sports alum and, and entertainers and they people. They do veteran stuff. And yeah. They did that thing recently where they went out and cleaned up the cemetery and power sprayed all the headstones and grave markers and stuff and cut all the brush and done it a couple of times and I, I like I like doing stuff like that you know we're by no means loaded but we're keeping our lights on and we're we're very blessed and and to be able to do stuff like this and give back to uh, the give kids the world group we have it good certainly better than a lot of people and uh, I, I love charities I love working with the right charities and uh world sports alumni is definitely one of those that i like what they do they give back. okay i gotta look into this area next i noticed from the time i blocked it to the time i actually um started detailing it and really looking at photos and everything there's something slightly going on different from left to right but i don't necessarily want to keep it as asymmetrical because like in one of the photos that I found it was a pretty good close-up particularly of this area of the, the dew claw right in here on one it looked like there were sweeping projections coming down and on the other it looked like there were these weird thorns or or bony protuberances um, so I don't know when you're picking symmetry and trying to figure out what you want to do like these areas right down in here um, I may actually go back, I don't know, because I do like this look here. It kind of follows this subform down, but the picture I saw specifically of his right foot, it was like right in here, this That's duke claw. So fast. I can't follow you from this piece, but go ahead. Yeah, but this, this area right in here, 
how they have these little bumps. That was clearly visible on one of the one of the pictures I saw of the actual boot, the costume boot. But I'm torn because I like this kind of swept forward look too. So consensus of opinions, what do we do? Keep the swept forward or do we do the little bony protuberances? What do you think? <clears throat> I think that if it's a little different from foot to foot, not so shabby. Like maybe they were there and maybe he scraped them on a rock and that's why they were more sleepy on one side and more novelty on the other. Yeah. It's just so weird when you're breaking something down and you're looking at it through those <laughs> eyes for the first time. You kind of rediscover the character. But I do like the way that those sweep forward. And welcome to make your comments too. Because I can only go by what I see. And if you guys have, have ever really looked into the creation of the suit. And what Millicent Patrick designed. I'm talking about for the second suit. Because she came in and rescued the concept. Um... You know, Bud Westmore had his ideas, and they they kind of brought that to the table and showed on film what it would look like. And people weren't too thrilled, so they went back and went to the drawing board, and Millicent Patrick gave us the creature that we see today. Um, but there are all these subtle little details, and they sculpted it fast. You know, when they sculpted this suit, there's a, an image of the behind the scenes of the creation of the original creature suit. And there were literally like five different sculptors working on this. Someone on the legs, someone on the torso, someone on the mask. Chris Mueller did most of the work on the mask. So it's really unbelievable when you see what those guys did. And Millicent's leadership and design. And again, if there are any questions that you guys have, please feel free to jump in and start talking. You know, leave comments, share, please. We really depend on you guys to, to give your two cents. Okay, there's another subform that I'm going to attack right in here. Again, it's on one of the other videos, one of the other um, still shots that I had of publicity photos. But there are all these neat little subforms in here. And the interesting thing is this is only the top of the boot that we're working on here. But you're also going to see once we mold the top, we've got to flip it over. And we're going to worry about getting the bottom kind of detailed out because he had this kind of a tread pattern. Little areas of his anatomy that were just bizarre looking at them you know in the bottom of the foot you don't really see that a lot like toe pads and calluses and stuff yeah it's very organic and very realistic and kudos to the sculpting team who for something that you probably saw a grand total of three seconds on film as he was swimming and not even well lit they detailed the heck out of the bottom of the the feet so we'll have to once we mold this we flip it over and detail the bottom clay before we do the bottom last bottom section bottom. of the mold. Yeah, and then it'll be poured through here and kind of rotoed and everything. So this first area here we've almost got built in. One of the things I love doing when it comes to organic sculpt and what a lot of people miss, and no, no shame because it's, it's very hard to get this, but it's the weight and distribution of weight and mass you figure this is a big a big creature this is a monster so he's got some weight even though he's you know fish man he's got no fish ain't light you ever try to pull a fish out of water no i mean god you know they're they're heavy or an alligator think of an alligator yeah. and the mass of you know their skin and their legs well, and they're all muscle all they do is use that muscle to swim all day right so they're when you, lean, but they're dense. So when we consider mass, we look at that stuff in nature, and it kind of gets into our subconscious. And when things don't have that same hang, that same organic nature, um, that's a problem. So when you're adding, 
things hang, things pull down because of gravity, so definitely keep that in mind. And when we're moving back and forth between that symmetry, you know, we're even looking at things like this area in here, because by the numbers, I'll be right back, I'm just going to look at distance here. By the numbers, we want this all to line up. So like right now, this particular line is the first line of the other foot here. And again, it doesn't have to be 100%, but I want it close. So this line here that we're going to refine is like the first line of the, uh, the scale or whatever pattern you want to call that, the spines, or maybe some sort of defensive spines or something that he has on his suit. You know, so we're going to go back and forth and map out where those spines are in relation to one sculpt versus the other sculpt kind of sim give them a little more symmetry. So we have our first hint there, second hint there. So at the hollow, which is what this is, we do have to dig this out a little bit. And again, this is all just trying to fix up the symmetry a little bit more. But to those that are joining us on YouTube, thank you for tuning in. And please, you know, share, like our page, subscribe. Because as I said on the, uh, the Facebook, um, we are still in the process of getting our sponsors for the event and everything like that which is always the case with charity functions, is that people are a little slow to jump on board. But um, it helps when you have a situation like, okay, we have so many subscribers on our YouTube channel. So remember, sponsorships, they want something out of it too. Aww, your nephew's here. Little Michael. Hello, Michael. So we have this hollow in here, that's what I'm working on right now, which would correspond over here. <laughs> Gotta come up a little bit, because this subform here, don't want to miss that. Again, we're just giving the illusion of mass and weight. But like I was saying, like, subscribe, share, all those things are going to help us immeasurably when we move forward with this, as we go forward. Like I said, we have this other form right here on this line. And this, this clay, just so you also know, it's the medium, uh, medium monster clay. And you can see it's quite firm. So I wouldn't probably get the firm unless you really have strong, strong hands. But the soft is a little too soft for this Florida heat. Yeah. I suppose if you lived in a northerly state, you could go with the soft. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, here, we usually try to keep our, our shop, you know, around 74 is what the AC is set. It usually hovers right around 80 or so. And even that makes this pretty soft. But sometimes too soft. Okay. Add two in here. Again, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask away. I know that it's not as exciting as if we were doing a portrait or a likeness or something like that or the mask but a lot of the same techniques are going to be used matching it back and forth so there's an interesting other other line here that i also want to follow 
it's more of an angle coming off of this it's a sweeping back and I guess it's like an ankle or something like that but at the same time I'm worried about the symmetry and the anatomy I want that to match up and it seemed that there was like an ankle that I saw in clearer photos that fell right about here so it almost gave it almost like a digipaw kind of look like a, a weird thing going on you know with that so I want to carry that through as well and with that our ankle is probably going to wind up right about in here we're just going to kind of push that in And also the reason that, you know, we're working off of a finished piece and a blocked in piece is what I really wanted to do is show you kind of cooking style and being able to go back and forth at points during the sculpt where we have um, the finished one I work out all the bugs on. You know, when I did that, it's different when you're doing a, a you know, a live sculpting demo and you've never done something before. But with this, I wanted to get kind of a, a rough idea of what we were going to be looking at so we could head them off in the past and you guys see pure technique rather than, you know, moving around clay and trying to figure out best placement of things. So that's why we started with detailing the second one live. But it's the same basic prompt, uh, premise. <coughs> you see how that ankle fictitious though it is kind of overhangs the bottom spines and fins of the foot it's almost got like a reminded me of a lionfish when I saw it how it had these spikes and darts that looked like they could come out of that foot but we'll get to that First things first. It's a long process. And as I said also, this will be available um, after the fact. You guys are seeing it first, but you can always tune back in and scrub. You now fast forward through the video, get through the boring parts and see more of the excitement. And then we're going to try once the gilibration is concluded put all of these elements into an edited DVD uh, or electronic file that you guys can use and, and see a little bit easier than watching hours and hours of sculpting. Recently had a friend visit the studio and I felt so guilty because it's like, are you sure this isn't boring to you? I mean, I have to get this worked on, but I also want to visit with my friend. And he said, no, I like watching you work. <laughs> but that's more of those subforms. And then right back in here, we're going to attack the slope of that ankle joint or ankle bone in here and that's the one thing that's one thing I like about working with the monster clay is that it's an additive and reductive sculpting that you have to do I think that monster grew hmm? see his whole ankle and the top of his sock. Well, he's an eight-year-old boy. He's going to grow. <laughs> well, we've been waiting for him to grow for a year. He hasn't had a growth spurt. Now, all of a sudden, all his jeans are too short. 
Yeah. And everybody just asked me because his birthday's in two weeks. What size is he in? I'm like seven. <laughs> no, not anymore. <laughs> I have to take him to Anderson and buy some pants. Now we have the slope of this angle, right? This is what I'm talking about. One of the things that you don't think about art that often. If you, you know, I'll just make a little tiny change. But if you take one little change anatomically, you have to change everything relative to that. Okay, see how the shape of that ankle is coming in? And then we have all this extra material here that we'll have to shave down. So I'm going to go with my ribbon tool because you can use the wire tool. But again, this is just a rounded tool. This is more for refining. This will take massive amounts of material off quickly. So I'm just going to use the edge of that and kind of dig in here a little bit more. Get some of that depth I was talking about. Oh, the mess making? Yeah. This is the part that makes me crazy. He does all these little shaved off bits and then I have to go behind him and pick him up because he doesn't pick him up fast enough for my liking. I'm like under your foot trying to scoop up all these little clay shavings. So I'm at fault for your obsessive compulsive nature. You love me because I have attention to detail. Oh, I know. But I, I did that on the other one. I don't like a lot of mess when I'm working either. I like it to be fairly, you know, clean because a clean shop is a good shop. You know, you don't have the mess and the, where is this, where is that? And most well, of the time... Nobody else can see the rest of this joint because it's piles of stuff. Yeah, we often live there. Because we're working, you know, bear in mind, this is a small shop. By most people's standards, this is a, a closet. I mean, we got 200 square foot of, of working space here that fills up fast when we have, uh, a, you know, a room full of people. Because we have, you know, me, Amber, Ted, our tech, and then we have Chelsea. And at any one time, we could have four or five people in the shop. And it gets a little bit crazy. But we, we kind of just go with the flow and finish one project, clean up, work on the next. If we're working current, concurrently on several projects, we stage it to where we have, okay, we're working on this area. Okay, we're working on that area. So. It's like centers in kindergarten. It really is, <laughs> yeah. That's a good, good descriptor. So we have that ankle, and then I'm putting in this little tiny subform back here that could be a tendon or whatever. Best example of mass and anatomy, it was land, landmark film back then. But even today, it's like, it's the standard. Jurassic Park. If you guys remember, even when they did CGI for the dinosaurs, they had mass. And it's something that all other incarnations of the film, even the more modern ones, they just didn't nail as effectively as on the first movie, I think. I still judge it by that. It was just so incredible. I mean, you... You had very few moments like that in, in cinema that you can just say, Oh my God, this is a real dinosaur. And that was one of them. It's like in... In 70... What was it? 70... 79? 78? When Superman the motion picture came out? Superman the movie? Their tagline was, You will believe a man could fly. And you did. For just a moment, you believed that, that Superman was a real thing. And... When Jurassic Park came out, you believe that those things were walking around. Okay, so we have our ankle. We have our subforms back here. We can further define those out as we move forward. Okay, so now we have that. We can tackle this area again because we have our subforms. We know that this this area or this fin, the spine, is going to come down kind of like that.
but it's pretty limited. So we might have to move that back a little bit. Because if we're looking at this as our ankle, the last part of that's going to be right around here. So probably there. So this area in here is where we're going to put that little second subform or knuckle. Right in here. Happy little subform. And we're going to do some reduction here. And this changed quite a bit from our original footprint because just to get scale and size and um, proportions close before we started putting clay on this, we started out with the cast of Ted's foot, the actor's foot. And once we had that, that life cast in there, that foot, we then built clay on it. But we came up with this footprint, which is the line in red that you see here. And that was based on an action figure, just to get us kind of where we needed to be. And you see how different, judging by that red line, it came out a lot further on the figure, extended a lot further, was wider on the other side as well. So through photographs, we whittled that all down to the, yeah, streamlined it. But it's funny watching... You know, watching the progress, I, I, again, I probably should have videoed that just for posterity. But, you know, it's, it's hard to say what people would be interested in seeing and what they wouldn't. It's getting to that point where we're going to have to be that shop that videotapes everything, just like those people you see videotaping all this crazy stuff that goes down, like in the street or whatever, and the first thing they do is whip out their phone to videotape something horrific happening instead of calling for help. <laughs> oh, the shop's on fire. Let's videotape it rather than call the fire department. Right. We'll put it on YouTube later. Yeah, we're often challenged with, with that type of thing, though, because there's some stuff that we just can't show you know there's you know there's the the wonderful the NDAs yep non-disclosures kill us sometimes because people think we disappear and it's because we're working we're on working. yeah and you get the obligatory messages and stuff are you guys doing okay I haven't heard from you in a while yeah we're fine we're, we're working just working on NDA Because typically it's those same NDAs that not only take up all your time, but they're needed like post haste yesterday. And then they take you out of the public eye for a year and a half or whatever. And not that we don't take pride in those projects. It's just quiet pride, not public pride. Oh, yeah. Because those are the kind of things that you can't say that you did it. You can't say that you did it. Yeah, we've had a lot of those lately. Or it's the secret keeping. You know what's coming, and you know, you hear friends of yours. Right. And you fr hear friends that invariably they all know what's going on and oh I I know someone on the inside that says this and it's like you're really on the inside and you just have to giggle behind their backs because you can't say oh I know the story. No, that's really not what's happening. Or if you only knew that. Yeah, it always starts out usually, um, <coughs> oh I heard. Or my friend is doing this, and he said... I think for me the favorite is people hear one tiny little bit of information and they go wild on it. It's like, honey, that's 
the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more coming with that you don't even know. Oh, yeah. Like, you're excited about this one little thing. Wait till you see what's coming right behind it. Oh, yeah. But it's hard. I mean, many people, like, when I was on Face Off, I hate to... I hate to throw that in there, but it's something that is relative to what we're discussing. When I was on Face Off, we couldn't tell anyone what we did for months. You know, we had to sit on that secret, and then it's like and once they're... I was they're... on the Huh? I was on sabbatical. Oh, yeah. And then you're on television later, and people are like, hey, you weren't on a sabbatical. You were on TV. Yep, so you have to keep secrets, even from family. You know, you had to keep secrets from everyone. What you working on? Oh, uh, no. nothing. Oh, Stella says hi. That's our baby. Hello, Stella. But you know, I met my whole family because of Face Off. Because of losing face off. So that's the best possible reason to lose face off. Yeah, well, you lost face off, and we almost lost the television, so. <laughs> because of uh, our daughter. Yeah, that little scrump one there, that's our daughter. And she says, hi. Our little baby librarian. She's such a nerd. I love her. Nothing wrong with the nerds. The meek shall inherit. And I know that watching this... I thought it was man creates dinosaur, dinosaur eats man, woman inherits the earth. Yes. <laughs> the meek as well. I never believed that when I was a kid, by the way, because my parents always tried to tell me, Honey, you'll be fine. <laughs> Your daughter says I didn't mean to. <coughs> she what? didn't mean to nearly destroy the oh. television. Well, it was a gut reaction. You know, what you gonna do? It was like one of those moments where somebody goes bananas and turns over the table. That's kind of like one of those things. Lap desk full of crap at the television that was mounted above the fireplace six feet high. And she's like, whoa, a whole rage. Are you kidding me? I, I don't know. To me, I was just living it. You know, I, I didn't understand at the time. But I, I think other people were angrier about me going home than I was. Well, because you weren't going home yet. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. Well, you knew you were eliminated, but you also knew at the time that you weren't going to be left home. Well, I knew. That was the weird thing about behind the scenes and, and everything. Daddy says they're looking good. He can't wait to wear them. <laughs> yeah, we're going to try to build these with comfort in mind. You need to put some of them insoles in his in little water shoes. Yes. Get him some arch support. I'm yeah. Down to the Sporting goods store and get some plantar fasciitis jobbies. Those water shoes don't have much support. No. And you know that's that's another benefit of of you know the the face off. We we joke about this a uh, uh, off. I don't I don't want to say often. It's not like we remember that time, but I mean you think about how events like that can just change your life and have a ripple effect because like I said I, I lost face off and I went on different show circuits than I would have gone on if I was a winner and you know I, I went to smaller shows and more local shows because I kept my day job I still was selling materials and doing all that stuff and yeah, private commissions, and and so I would go to shows, and if they were local or if they were friends of mine, hey, can you come out and you know promote whatever and sign autographs and stuff, which is totally weird. I I don't I don't know. I'm just not an autograph person as far as why people would want my signature, other than 
identity thieves. <coughs> but um, people are so they're so in it, you know. They they love the show. They love what it represents. But I was able to, like I said, go to shows that I ordinarily would not have been able to go to. And I went to this one little show, Claremont Comic Con. Thank you, Scott. Um, went to Claremont. My friend Scott runs that. And I've known him for years before Face Off. And he asked me if I would come up to the show. So I went up, and that's where I met Amber. Yeah. Sweet boy, we love him. And because of that, I met. I actually met her mom first. She came up and said that if she went home and didn't give. Her, da- her granddaughter an autograph of yes, the, the, the guy the from breaker. Face Off um, she'd get in trouble so it wasn't until after I went and met Amber that I was like oh wow this is a different feeling met Amber then within what it was by that February I was doing another show and I had a model cancel and that was for um, Sci-Fi Bartow and I knew yeah. Love them. Yeah, and great little a show too. Show. I wouldn't say it's little. It's pretty damn huge. Well, it's the whole it's downtown now. Whole several blocks. But it's one of those places where it's home and you feel safe. And I know that I can. We can go as a family, have our booth, and set our children free, and loose in the streets, and nothing's gonna happen to them because. If Lori or Sean or any of our vendors that we know well enough, you know, they're bent because we know everybody there. They're all good people and good family people. And if they see our children, A, they're not going to let anything happen to them. And they'll probably eventually come back in a golf cart with Sean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's really a, a family. Like, I found your kid. I brought it back. Family type environment that that is it's really, really so cool. fun. It's fun and it's loud and it's. It's a street great. festival. And our kid literally fell asleep in the street more than once. <laughs> literally laying on the pavement. Lila nappy nappy time on the pavement. I'm jealous of those kids sometimes how they can just fall asleep anywhere. The boy's just as bad. Yeah. I'm surprised his neck is not. Broken, curled up in lawn chairs, camp chairs, under tables at shows, hiding under the tablecloth. You want to talk about the monster kid? He's the monster under the table, rather than the monster under the bed. But yeah, that was the first time Ted modeled for us because the canceled. The canceled uh, model. And I knew he had some experience doing a uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show. Don't tell people that. Huh? <laughs> Don't tell people that. Why? <laughs> That's a badge of honor. But yeah, he, he played Brad. Is that the only character Ted ever played? Usually Brad. Yeah. So when I when I had the canceled model, we were like, "Well, I don't know what we're gonna do now." And he's like, "Oh, I'll 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 put it on." I'm like, "Really? You can you can model it?" He goes, "Sure." I think so. And he um, it's funny because he got on the makeup, and as soon as he was done, he became the zombie. You know, that was the first thing we did was the zombie makeup. Kind of a, you know, just a generic kind of zombie. And that was the birth of the walking walking Ted. Ted. Yes, the real walking Ted. That's how you played Eddie a couple of times, too. The skinniest Eddie I've ever seen. Yes. (laughs) For those of you who don't know, who have lived under a rock, Eddie was not a, 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 a slight man. Played by Meatloaf. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he was he was of the bigger persuasion. Okay, this is again I'm just comparing it to the other one. But yeah, Ted has been my model so many times. 
happy. I, I really love, you know, and thank God, you know, I've got a family of my dreams. My, my father-in-law is like my best friend. And, you know, he has come over and helped mold tech when he didn't know really what it was. He came over and just picked it up and ran with it. And he's helped me on so many projects. And he'll probably be molding his own feet with me. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's a blessed life. It gets a little hairy sometimes with bills and everything like that. But I'm not going to complain. I won the the family lottery, and now he he ha he's not he's not a short man. This this walking Ted, if you've ever seen him, he is one of the tallest drink of water zombies you'll ever see. Um, six four. I think he always argues that he's not six four, that he's six three or six two or something like that. He's a tall man, and the original creature, oddly enough. Ben Chapman, the land creature, was 6465. So we are um, able to use Ted for this role. And it's kind of historic. He's going to actually be down in the Silver Springs where the original elements of that were shot. There in Wakulla Springs. Um, we couldn't get calls back from Wakulla. FYI. But the people from Silver Springs have been extremely helpful. Megan DeYoung there and the rest of the team for the event. So he will be standing on the banks of the Creatures Lagoon. Creature Springs, I think, is what they technically call it when you're on the... Well, the I have a wonderful photo up directly in front of the spring. Yes. Yes, we are temporarily commandeering um, what is known as now the Sea Hunt Paddock. They're actually going, or Pavilion, Sea Hunt Pavilion, and that will temporarily be renamed uh, the Creature Pavilion, because it's... It's directly in front of Creature Spring, where it's actually blocked off currently. Right. There's and you can some see... There's on the docks and the, um, all the wood stuff there started in the front and they're kind of working their way around to refurb some of the uh, wood rot and such. Hopefully by September they'll have made it over there. Oh, I hope so. Well, half of it was redone, wasn't it? The one side, just the, the main side for Sea Hunt, um, the, the creature side was still mildly dilapidated, but they kind of cordoned it off, so we're going to turn that portion into a queue and the section where the actual photos will be taken actually points right back at Creature Spring. So it's actually a better photo op than the side that Creature Spring is on. Mm -hmm. And we would love to actually get down in the springs. In the water, but that's a no-go. Yeah, yeah. Because that, I, I understand totally their, their trepidation because number one, it's a conservatory. It's it's one of those areas that they don't want a lot of people trudging around back there, first of all. And we second of all... It. Huh? You want to preserve it. Yeah, and you want Ted to be safe. And, um, you know, there are alligators back there, snakes, probably water moccasins, and, you know, I don't want him being mistaken for food, either. But... We don't have anything official, though, but you guys, um, there's going to be some big news coming probably later this year once we get everything finalized. But again, um, RJ Grady, the kilted creature, and his lovely bride, Cindy, we've been working on a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff. We're not even launched with this year's Gillibration. And we've got some ideas for next year's Gillibration that are going to blow you guys away for the uh, Revenge of Gillibration, because that would be the anniversary of Revenge of the Creature. They were a year apart in release, 
So there's always something going on. But we may finally get our creature in the water. Not necessarily yet. Wakulla or... Or, um... Yeah. Still very much in the works, but they seem very very positive about us getting out there so and then of course um we had someone from wikiwachi contact us i'm not sure where that's going to go but they were talking about the possibility of the gill man getting into the water with the mermaids but that i'm nervous about because like ted will admit openly um he he doesn't have the lung capacity of rico browning that's for certain And again, it's his safety that we're concerned with, but we'll see. A lot of stuff in the works, though. That's why I say, if you're interested in this sort of thing, please like, share, subscribe. Um, we're living in a social media world, and people don't want to do anything unless they see action you know what what are they seeing on social media what are they seeing people share so they go by subscribers they go by what's your not even so much what's your um support on facebook they do look at that don't get me wrong but they're looking you know what's your what's your youtube viewership and up until a few weeks ago, we really didn't focus on YouTube. We looked at, you know, Facebook Live. And we had a couple of videos, but nothing much. And then they're like, well, you got to get on YouTube. And then recently we were made very aware that we have to get on YouTube. And got to get, um, you know, video presence where people go for videos. So much like the website we were dragged kicking and screaming into modern technology and that's exactly the case with uh, with this you know we have to be more accessible to our followers so please like share subscribe if you guys want to see more of stuff like this not just the creature this is just taking up a lot of our time but understand we're a working studio you know 365 days a year so we not only have this work that you see but we're also sculpting heads for Mego or doing theme park projects or working on this thing for a private commission you know, or traveling to the many shows that we go to to promote the work we do or that sort of thing. So your help definitely gets the word out there. I'm going to count here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm going to have to tighten these up a little bit, I think. see all these lines that I did in one side have to be translated to the other. So where I put in these markers or these space fillers I'm going to have to build those back in. I did the same thing on the other side. You just got to miss that. One thing to mention also is that with the monster clay, if it is a little bit firm, you can always heat it up in the microwave and you can get it much, much softer. Almost like a silly putty consistency. So it's a little easier on your hands. Just making some measurements as to where these little spines. 
don't know if you can show that briefly, Amber. The area that we're working on, on this foot, because that's what we're trying to match to this other foot. I'm trying to keep it as congruous. Well, I've got the camera angle so you can actually see what you're looking at. Oh, this one you can see with as well? Yeah. But this is a little bit. This is the area here that I'm working on. All those spines, it looks like the kind of like the mane of a lionfish or something. I imagine that at the end of those spines there's like little darts or defensive things going on there. I don't know. That's kind of the cool thing about this is that it leaves it to your imagination. But I'm measuring roughly distance on the one. Again, it doesn't have to be exact. It has to be close. So we're adding back in all those little spiny details. Right now it's just the little worms that we're putting in there. I don't want to extend too far past our line because these quills on this side are about at that same elevation. So we're just keeping the same footprint, basically, from one side to the other. This is exactly how we built up that side, though. I'm going to shift this for a moment. Yeah, this area here I'm going to have to take in a little bit. Any other questions you guys have, please feel free to ask. I don't know if anybody's in questioning mode. It's more like a mesmerized, intense watching. Mesmerized, intense watching, or unfathomable boredom? Well, by all six people who are watching. Yeah. And we're probably one of them, right? I don't know that it actually counts. Well, guys, if you will, um, it would be a huge help if you would go on um, your other social media. If you are watching and, and you want to share this with your friends or on any of the groups you're on, believe me, when it gets shared by you guys, it carries a lot more weight. When I share it, it's like, oh, there's that guy again. But when you guys share it, it is you know, viewed a little differently. So please feel free to share this on your timeline take a break from watching us we'll be here when you get back and just copy the link from the uh the live stream and go put it in your facebook and say hey he's live streaming over at uh on youtube if you want to check out what's going on in the world of the gilibration and the creation of the the foot now's the time because that kind of stuff helps out more than you guys would even think. There are a lot of eyes on us too right now. We have other shows that have been watching us and, and you know helping get the word out. Um, when we were in St. Augustine this past weekend, we got interest from, was it uh, Vibe magazine or something like that? We got to follow up with them because they're willing to you know cover our you know making ofs and stuff like that it's a weekly format magazine so i mean 
there is interest. It's just getting the word out there that's sometimes a little harder. Especially since I'm not very geared towards self-promotion. I will promote the heck out of other people. But it's always like self-serving when it comes to me. I'm just a little shy about it. So it would definitely help if you guys aided in getting the word out there. And I know that the kids who give kids the world would be grateful. Now, the cool thing about this, you see how I'm working these spines and bringing the details out. The techniques are the same as if you were adding a vein. You might have to, like, tone down how much pressure you use, but it's basically the same thing. If you're making a vein on something, you're just working with tubes like that, just exactly the same way. And the reason this side looks so much deeper than the other is because there is a subform, again, that I never really saw on film. Um, this little wing you can see in the B-roll here. Um, this little fin that bisects that bottom section. It gives it a little more... Uh, visually, it gives it more to look at, but I mean, it's functional. You could imagine that that would grab the water and help him to propel through the water a little better. I hope you guys are having a good Friday so far. We are going to finish up this foot here. Um, if not today, definitely by tomorrow we're going to be done with this foot and we'll get the detail on it like we did the other side. Um, and then probably tomorrow, I'm going to want to say tomorrow night, but possibly uh, as late as Sunday night, we're also going to run our first auction to benefit this project. Um, we've got several masks, some that were donated, um, the, the Whispers. We did the show in Sonoya at the German Abraham's shop, if you haven't checked him out. He is amazing, Chris Twelman, uh, and he had us out to his shop in Sonoya, and we brought our, our uh, Whisperer masks, and uh, Chris Twelman was good enough to host this event and had us out. We brought the masks, and then, for charity, um, Oscar, Red Hat, Oscar Red Hat from uh, the Whisperers, artist himself, he asked if he could borrow the Whisperer masks that we had there at the show to take photos with, the photo ops. We said, sure. So afterwards, he autographed, and he and the other Whisperers, and Cassidy, um, the character Lydia, if you're familiar with that show, she signed our version of Alpha. And she was really great, too. I didn't like her on the show. She was one of those characters that you didn't know where she was coming from and she's since kind of shown her colors that she's one of the good guys so far spoiler alert but that's been for weeks so i think i can talk about it but um she was nice enough to sign the masks and so we have some autographed whisper masks that'll be going up um many of you know that i have done work for Migo on some of their figures, such as the Marilyn Monroe, Andre the Giant, the Impractical Jokers, and we are going to be auctioning some of the Impractical Jokers so far. I also have the Marilyn Monroe, but we're going to do those a little bit later. But the um, Impractical Jokers we're going to put um, on auction, signed cards, Wherever you want them signed, I'll sign them. If you don't want me to sign them, I won't sign them. But um, we're going to be auctioning those off, and the proceeds will benefit the construction of this suit, because it's thousands of dollars to produce a suit like this. And it's for the event, yes, but we are a non-profit, and I don't want to take any of the money that we're bringing in in sponsorships 
to have to put it towards this. So we're auctioning um, things like the action figures, the masks, some other collectibles, busts, statues, that sort of thing. Some rare prototypes and what they call artist's proofs when you're working on a prototype or something like that. They may be a proof of, you know, a design that you keep on hand in your shop after the fact. Because it's not like it could be sold as a piece, as a production piece. Because it might be done slightly different or not approved color-wise or whatever. So we may have some of those as well that we're going to offer. Some very rare items that you just don't see every day. So that will most likely be Saturday night. So we're going to have a very full weekend. Okay, this line here, right behind the ankle, that represents the last quill that he has, the main quill. So we're just going to put that in. Taper this down a little bit. And add to it. How are we doing in the world? Again, thank you guys so much for tuning in. For the, uh, what do we got? Six still? Four? Six. Six. Thank you guys for hanging out. And we are going to be um, doing more. I know that it's been very heavy creature-related stuff lately. But we are going to be doing a lot more in the coming weeks where we broadcast a lot more general stuff. You know, like, oh, we've got a head that we're casting. Or this is a private commission of this thing. So how do we do that? So we are going to do more tutorials and share that with you guys. And like I said, the best way to stay on top of all that is liking, subscribing, sharing. You are the lifeblood of the shop's um, mission basically to get the word out there and if anyone knows me at all out there you know that if you've ever needed anything as far as tech support or whatever I usually jump in and give my two cents because I do believe like Dick Smith I wouldn't know half of what I know if it weren't for Dick Smith Dick Smith being the makeup artist for such films as The Exorcist you know we, we love his work we've come to admire it greatly but the one thing that set him apart from many other special effects artists aside from his immense talent and ingenuity was that he shared what he knew so that's one of the reasons that I love these videos because I can kind of just by you hanging around for a little while and through osmosis I can show you how we do certain things and maybe when you pick up the clay on your next project it'll be like oh I remember that more than anything, I want you guys to just know that we screw up. You know, we're working on something and, oh, I don't like that. I'm going to change it. Or, you know, one of the reasons that I love having Amber around, um, she'll tell me if something isn't right, she has a very good eye. And she's a very good sculptor in her own right. But she can come on and say, hey that isn't right or that could be a little cleaner or that finger is too long or that thing is and it helps a lot so we mess up and I want you guys to see that too because we learn more from our mistakes than our successes sometimes and you see how we're just working these fins in
So if you're hanging out on the feed here, maybe it's playing in the background or you have a break from time to time, we can have like some trivia games or something like that as we're sculpting here. You know, a lot of it's stuff that we can cover. You know, just from talking as we go. We don't have to just talk about creature. We could talk about, hey, what movies are out there? What you going to be having going on this weekend? What's your favorite drink? What's the best way to hide a body? You know, stuff like that. From the special effects standpoint. We joke, but sometimes you just gotta hide a body. You know, Cala just isn't loaded up with as many murder shacks as what they have in and around Sonoya, Georgia. There were areas when we were going through Sonoya that were so beautiful. And then you'd go a couple blocks and you'd see some scary areas. Sonoya and Pigeon Forge. Remember Shacks left, right, and center? Pigeon Forge was nice, yeah. There was a lot of murder shacks. I don't think I was as worried of the murder shacks as I was the... Falling off the road. Falling off the road, yeah. You look down to the, to the right and you see... Get the, the cavern. Right to the road. It's like, oh look, there's there's no road there. It just goes away. Yep. So that ain't cool. And you can see all this refining. Because what we're going to do after we get this in is we're going to put that other fin over this. So the areas below that have to be fairly detailed. But just to a point. But we keep that quill-like appearance. And you can see how I'm building in as I do what's going to be visible. Before I even do my scratch detail, I'm going in and just pushing that clay with the soft edge of this tool to have that finny kind of striated look. And I'm sorry, my fingers are right in the way, I'm sure, from this video image. But you see, like, right in here the striations of the fin just by moving the clay you get a pretty good look See you later. Have a good time. And I'll show you how we further detail that later on. Right now we're just getting those striations in there. tops of these because we don't necessarily want them to look like like um, chisel points we want them to have a certain flatness or roundness to the top because like I said when I saw the original and really studied um, the pictures of the foot it looked like those were the quills almost like in a sheath like what a lionfish or something would have so by rounding out that top, it looks like it could be that, that bony quill. 
up here I'm not quite so worried because that's going to be layered with that other fin. Aww, we'll come back. Sweet daughter. She's that. She wants to know if we need coffee. Yes, please. Daddy says yes, coffee, Stella. And I know that this is, you know, a lot of repetition. Feel free to go and come and tell your friends, come back, check on our progress. This is part of what we do in our live studio stream. A lot of it is boring. People think, oh, you get to do art all day. Yeah, just like this. This is exactly, you're getting to see... A day in the life. Not always glamorous. Not always fun. What I consider fun. I like doing this stuff and it kind of loses, loses me for, you know, several hours. fun part will be molding too. You guys are going to get to see the molding process on this. And I'll show you as we move forward as well different things that we look for when we're molding you know in the sculpting stage. Okay we know that it's going to be this way when we mold it so what do we have to do to make that molding job? Sometimes you can't because the aesthetics of the piece is very important. You know, it has to look a certain way. Sorry, this isn't an original sculpt. It's, you know, we want to do honor to the creators of the original suit. But um, when you can't change the design or, or modify things, you can use your tricks to um, make your life a little bit easier, at least the output, the casting's a little easier. Okay, so this is our last quill coming down here. skin between which from the underside the original kind of looked like there were these delicate billows in there as well which I look forward to playing with I don't know what they used as reference but Millicent Patrick when she did that she came up with the design for this beastie You gotta say, because we know so many Michaels, you know. We do. Michaels was a popular name. Yep. But yeah, you you have to watch out for undercuts. And you'll notice on this one, can can they see that one in the in the B-roll under the fingernails or under the toenails here? Well, he talks about a good point. Michaels heard me a lot over the years, I'm sure, talking about undercuts, and he's learned a lot on his own. Um, but undercuts are something that you want to be careful of because you how are you going to cast it? Okay, so these toe nails, see under each of those they're curled, they're hooked, hooked down. So under here I've built up what will be a negative fin in the finished piece. So when we're molding this and we flip it over and we do that bottom, Basically, when we pour our latex in there and slosh it around, this area will act as a little vent and allow this, the, the latex to get into those toenails a little better. And then what we do once it's cast is we just trim that out. We just trim it out with some cuticle scissors or cuticle nips and it's, you know, like it wasn't even there. So, and we'll show you on the, on these, cleaning them up. It should be pretty simple. We're going to have a top. 
and because of the size and everything we've got a lot of a draw here so we may have to do a seam here worst case scenario so we have an a side a b side and a c side will be the bottom but um we can get by with just doing a two part where we have a top and a bottom that would be glorious because then we just drill this out and that's where we'll pour in our latex slosh it around pour it out just like we did with the mask when you look at the video on that and after two or three coats we have the finished piece again do you one, want to drill it out or we could do like we did with the um the funnel um that one nightmare roto cast jobby where we created the plug and just put like a cork and glue it to the top of that thing and, and then mold around it so it it intrinsically already has a force brew in that Mm. It's Rather possible. Than drilling it and compromising the stone. Yeah. Because you know it's how plaster possible. is. It's strong, strong, strong until you get it just right. And then it's like, crumbly bit. Yes. And I don't know that we necessarily um, want to <laughs> have another 70 pound mold. Because the, the mold for the head actually wound up being like almost 70 pounds, right? It's nuts. It was exhausting making that casting. Okay, these last little spines are kind of like ancillary spines that I'm doing. What? Ancillary? ancillary? Yeah. Tertiary. Ancillary. Huh? You said ancillary. Ancillary, you know. You have it with your Bloody Mary. Pepperoni. Buffalo wing. Little slider cheeseburger. You know, a bloody berry should not just be a drink; it's a snack. Yes. And extra spicy. And dirty like martini. Yeah. Going from olive juice to that. I think that's about as far as I can go there. Now we're going to work on moving back. You can see that in the secondary shot. Can you? Or is that blocked, hon? No, I can see it. In this back section here. This back section in here, you can see all the different details and folds and everything. So that's what we're going to be working on as we move around. So we've basically got from here subforms to here. Now we need to work on this back piece here, which is actually corresponding to this. So, again, you're getting tired of seeing these little worms tubed up here, aren't you? But this is the exciting life that we live. So, again, we're just going to come up the same distance here and that's like a ha uh, like some sort of quill that's growing so this is actually just the um, the base because we got to come over that with that fin that I was telling you about but I'll show you the trick with that we have to do a fin that looks like it overlaps this side of the the quills. On the other side it doesn't have that. And I looked at multiple images of his foot. I don't know if there was more than one mold or something or more than one sculpt. I know that two, two different actors played the Gill Man, but I can't tell whether um, there was some differences in the, in the feet. Um, Michael wants to know how long do ultra-cal molds stay good for? Ultra-cal molds? Like ever? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've had some molds that I did. 
I've had to throw away before they wore out. I mean, you have to be careful with them and keep them hydrated. But Ultra Cal molds, they can last indefinitely. The important thing is if they are baked, you have to hydrate them. And eventually they will, you know, wear out. But, um, they'd be good pretty much indefinitely. Now, we're working on this fine, subtle detail of this little foot spine, this thing that he has jutting off of his heel. So, I know I want that to be tapered, because it kind of looked like a... Almost like, like I said before, something that might be a little more crustacean than aquatic, like a, a fish. So I'm doing in some little subtle forms. And then I'll show you how we do like the the little ridges that he has. That's so easy. Because basically we just cut in to the material like that. And then we're going to use the soft edge of this to soften out those corners. And you can be directional with it pull and push on depending on what side you're working on and then with your finger you just pull it and you get those subforms look at it from all angles and all lighting because a lot of times you can see what you're missing from another angle and then I'll show you kind of a preview, but we're going to go back once we do the final detail and brush over it and kind of sculpt with the direction of the brush. And that's how you get those beautiful kind of lines that look organic and realistic just by going over it like that. And it looks, I'm not sure if it's coming through as far as the detail goes, but you can get those spines very realistically. Okay. So now we're moving on to that that big fin flap, that overlay. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to look at these basically side by side and I'm going to set my markers. I know right here is where I'm going to want it to end, terminate, but it kind of slopes down as it goes this way to just seeing the very tip of that final spine. So it will come up about like that. That's about as high as I want to go. Because if I'm comparing height, it's going to be fairly similar on both sides. Now, instead of putting a whole sheet of fin on there, we don't want to do that because then we're going to lose all this definition up here. So I will show you what we're going to do. We're going to take a little worm of clay. Just kind of roll it into a little rope so we have something like that and then we're going to taper it down on one side so it's almost like a knife a knife point rounder on this side and tapered on this side I hope you like what you see man we're going to be able to uh, hook you up possibly with more than just a mask in the future because we will have these fine flippery feet that we can share with you. Not that the ones he did on his own are not damn good. No, Either. but you don't want those to get ruined. It's like my favorite pair of chucks. I got my favorite pair of chucks and then I got other ones that I can use so I'm not wearing down my favorite because one day... Well, they're like your vintage set. Oh, yeah. You put them in a shadow box and you say these are original creature feet. Oh yeah. Original tilted creature feet. But you'll have a backup is the important thing. Okay, so we have our worm rounded on one side, flattened like a chisel on the other. I don't know, can that, 
does that pick up pretty well? Yes. Okay. Because we buy the nice cameras. And what we're going to do is we're going to kind of follow this through just like on the other side and push there. And that's where our, our line is. I don't know if you can see that, but we're going to push this down and then just follow that contour. And it's going to look a little bunchy for now, but watch what happens once we start detailing this out. The other one started exactly the same. That would feel magic. I don't know about magic, but... <laughs> it's all about illusion, and that's how you get the... Which, by the way, that's my favorite tool you got there, sir. And somebody broke the tip off of it, so next time we go down to my favorite... I know, and I need my sculptor's thumb, too. My sculptor's thumb disappeared. In. And you might be asking, what is a sculptor's thumb? It's kind of like this. It's about, you know, three inches long or so, but it's made of beautiful smooth, either an olive wood or something like that. But it cups your thumb, so you're not wearing off your fingerprints or anything. You see, as we move again towards the back, we're just going to come down and kind of finish off. We might have to add a little bit more there. But you see how it tapers. That's the important thing. My almost shot arthritic hands. Okay, so layering. Now. Some days you just get rid of a, get, get rid of a bomb or a body. Yes. I always joke that there is a trick to getting rid of a body. Is this the sewing of the ham suit? Well, that's always a potential, you know, option. I'm just saying you dig a 10-foot hole, you put the body at the bottom of uh. four feet of dirt, and then a dog, a large dog, like a German Shepherd or a Rottweiler, and then the rest dirt. And then when they come by with the whole little, you know, metal detector body sonar zappy device, all they see is dog. You watch way too much crime drama shows. I didn't learn that from crime drama. That's just logic. Duh. Common sense. Okay, we're shifting though. Um, on this part, we're not going to use the olive tool quite yet because we need to knock that profile down. It's still a little bit thick. So I'm using this rounded tool. And that'll get into those little nooks and crannies. The crooks and nannies of the foot there. Huh? It's like a foot English muffin. Yes. And the only time I'm going to use this is like up towards the top where I'm trying to blend that edge. So we're going to use a combination of tools to give us that look. Probably don't be sounding question as somebody who does this for a living, but just it, it, maybe it's a preference thing. I would come in like blending that top area with those fancy little silicone tool jockeys that I got you. The rubber ones? Mm -hmm. They do work, but a lot of times they bend so much. And if you had like almost like a rounded one, I think that that would work really well. Um, but a lot of them are points or chisel ends. But it's all personal preference. That's the thing is I can show you what tools I use, but another artist may, you know, they may prefer a different type of tool. They're so subjective. It's so subjective to what you're working on, the material you're using. Downer angle, so because you, you're catching a lot of the back of your hand. Okay. Well, wherever you wanna, wherever you wanna go. But I don't wanna go too far and not catch the other piece in the back that you're referring to. It's 
as I'm digging in slightly, I want to keep the look that there is a a quill or some sort of spine under there. That's why I'm being careful not to lose that profile detail. Digging in slightly as I round that out. That's why I still just can't get that downward angle really the best. When you're working on something like that, that is the bane of our our job here is this is why we need to perfect that uh, shoulder mount budget parrot GoPro mold thing yeah strap so you can like legit see right down your arm yeah because exactly then you would see doing. what I see rather than trying to look over your knuckle but then I couldn't take swigs of coffee people would see me drinking my coffee See how we can just maintain that detail. And if you would, from time to time, let us know, like if you're watching, what the quality of the feed is, because we are constantly improving and learning. see how that's you know giving that layered effect and you know we talk a lot about symmetry and stuff like that but especially on a costume like this you want your symmetry to be pretty close but honestly how many people are going to see this from the side. You know, how many people are going to see both exactly from the side at the same time, at the same angle? So, don't kill yourself with symmetry. Make it look visually symmetrical, but don't, don't kill yourself either. If it's a likeness or something like that, you have to maintain symmetry. You just do. But in something like this, you have a little more give or take I'm not really liking how much further this is, so I'm going to take that down a little bit. It's just a little bit too much of a transition between the quill and that top. So, again, this is what you learn as you're moving forward with the sculpt. I'm just going to lower that elevation a little bit. Still want to keep that definition of the quill. But I'm taking down that that depth just slightly. Don't be afraid to say, you know what, that isn't what I want. And come back and just improve your, you know, your sculpt. Sometimes it even pays to walk away from it for a day or so and come back at a later date. You know, maybe come back at it later that day. But... get a different angle on it. Another thing I like doing with the sculpts is um, 
I like taking pictures of it because for some reason you can always see a little more of the details on film rather than looking at it in person. You can pick the flies out of it a little bit better, I think. I'm not saying obsess on it, but... Definitely helps you to see it from a different angle and get the best possible I know what I do look. Me. And you can see, really, honestly, we're moving very minute amounts of clay around. But a little bit of movement can make a big impact on your sculpt. So sometimes you want to move slowly. But I think I'm about happy with the elevation of this piece here. And how it tapers off down into this hollow. which will continue to refine. And um, one of the techniques that we use with the dog brush later on to get fine line details and make it look and appear more organic settles out a lot of these lines. It's actually like a, a rake tool almost. So we get it to a certain point and then we begin our refining. Pretty glamorous though, ain't it? Now one thing I don't know if I've mentioned when we did our measurements and everything for these, we came up with a base size that if everything on film could be translated, if we know that Ben Chapman is six foot five, if we know that in certain photos this shoe or boot goes from his ankle to if you were to take like a, we like using calipers to measure out and double check things like that. So if we're using the calipers and we're saying okay in this photo his his foot is equal to the distance between his ankle and his kneecap at a certain point. It's the same length. So then we go to our model or our even our ruler and we say okay our model it's you know whatever 18 inches from his ankle to his tibia, or not tibia, the uh... Why am I drawing a blank? Kneecap. Patella? Patella. Patella. It's always a lesson in anatomy. But if it's um, from his ankle to his patella, it's a certain 18 inches or whatever. Then we know that we need to shoot for that as far as the length this way. So latex presents a different issue than if we were to cast this in silicone latex has a shrink ratio a pretty grand shrink ratio it shrinks at about 12 percent depending on the blend of latex it can be 12 to 15 percent so the higher the solids sometimes the less the shrink but and the higher the quality less the water you have to be careful hello you have to be careful with how much shrink you build in. And this one we had to increase the overall length by 12%. So when we were measuring on Ted's ankle to kneecap, 
measured that out and then added the 12 percent and that's how we came up with the the figures for the length yep plus we were starting with the the cast if you look back at some of the other videos we have on our channel you actually can see the life casting of his foot and we did that with the shoe on it so we had the exact proportions of the shoe then we have to even build in the shrink for that so the the plaster that you see here is actually his cast foot with the shoe completed in there and fun with balloons yes fun with balloons go back watch the video you'll know what we're talking about All of these areas under here present undercuts, so we got to be sure that those are also cleaned up. And by the time we do our final pass, those will be, you know, bulletproof. Undercuts are our enemy. sometimes not necessarily avoidable so we have to just do the best we can but fortunately we're casting in latex which pulls out of undercut pretty well yeah latex um, being so flexible and also so thin the viscosity is thin when it goes in for the most part forgiving. very forgiving definitely as you're sculpting your piece whatever it is look at it from different angles because that's where you're going to see any kind of undercuts and potential issues with molding this one again because we're going to be taking that out and um, you know re-sculpting once we're done with the mold of the top we're going to be re-sculpting the detail of the bottom so we have a little more wiggle room but if you're doing something else like a monster mask, be careful as to your undercuts. So many people had molds lock on them on that on Pixar. Mm-hmm. It's a real thing. Molds locking and you know, usually it's not because of a vacuum or something like that. Although we have issues with vacuum on, on a lot of the things we do because you're covering it and you get mold shrinkage or slight expansion and that can affect how it demolds but like we're talking about a mechanical lock because of undercuts or you know n people not really knowing how molds work it's stone so it's very very dense and you can't necessarily say oh I'm gonna move this out of the way once it's in stone that's a literal term you know you're you're stuck and you wind up breaking your mold to get it out and then you've destroyed your original and you've destroyed your mold in the process and people think well I'll just use more leverage because there are mold jacks and things like that that you can use but I've seen a lot of molds break using a mold jack It's actually very, it's a cool design, but again, if it's not used properly, or you say, what it needs is a little more strength, you know, you wind up breaking the lip of your mold off. But they had those, you know, talk about the lab at Face Off, they pretty much had everything you could possibly need, and I think the entire eight weeks I was there, I used the mold jack once. It's like I would rather prepare the mold to where it will come off easily. And I can't even remember which one it was that I wound up using it, but it was the depth. It created so much vacuum that it would have been difficult for me to pop the mold mm. without it. But that was the only time. Oh, once you're testing your final, you can just use the air. The what? Once you're uh, casting your final, 
you can just use some compressed air. Yeah. On silicone or foam or whatever. Not so much on the monster bike. No. No. Monster clay is so dense and so waxy. That's just a patience thing. Or even white clay. Not good strength, but strength. Yes. We had to demold something that was roughly the size of a cow's head. And we had five pieces, I think. Five, five part mold, wasn't it? So Amber, the mini dynamo she is, she gets on top of this mold because we had gotten off all but one section, right? That had nothing to lock on to. Nothing. It black. It was all no vacuum. Knocks, no nothing. All vacuum was holding this in. And she had to literally straddle it. And using leverage and uncomfortable positioning basically push this mold section off while I was working from one side and we had I can't remember if it was Ted or Chelsea or both and we were just all yanking on this mold at the same time one hundred percent of that was just the vacuum created because of the depth of the sculpt and then we have no leverage because it was the last part, so there was yeah. no leverage. No knots to push off of, no lumps, no yeah. Because normally you can at least get a pry bar or a, you know, large screwdriver or something like that in there. Mm. Not as such. see how these spines are all lining up and kind of looking like the other ones. We don't have any of the, the detail in it yet, but like I said, we're going to show you the trick there. But you definitely see that bi-level on camera, right? You just got to keep alternating top and bottom so you make sure that you get all your undercut sealed up. Because that will all transfer into the mold. Again, if y'all are interested in participating in Gilibration this year, please feel free to follow us again. We have the Facebook page, okay, Hearts of Reality and Presents. For sale. Huh? So tickets are still available for sale as well as some vendor spots. So. Right. And all the links are on the Hearts of Reality page. But perhaps most importantly, sponsorships are available. And the way that we're setting up the program, it'll be a collectible program. Um, if you're fans of this genre, there's no doubt you know, or have even in your collection now, an old issue of Famous Monsters of Filmland, and that's what we want to do. A lot of the photos of the production of the suit, um, possible interviews, um, all sorts of little cool tidbits are going to be available in the program, not to mention the uh, itinerary of events for the day. 
So it'll be a nice collectible program, not like a little dinky thing that you'll never look at again. And it'll feature the artwork. Um, our intern Chelsea Vincent did for um, the Gillibration artwork. So it's a one of a kind, never before produced painting of Rico in his most famous role. And it's set up to look like a famous Monsters of Filmland. So your sponsorship will buy you ad space in that, which is sure to be a collectible after the fact. So it's not like a program that's going to get pitched after the event or you're going to see laying around on the floor afterwards. At least we hope not. And if you do see him laying around on the floor, pick him up. Because we're setting this up also that you could have Rico or Ginger Stanley if she's able to uh, attend. You'll be able to have them autograph the cover. But it's also a commemorative um, issue that will showcase what Hearts of Reality and Give Kids the World is. Um, the Florida State Parks for Silver Springs. So there'll be a lot of stuff in there. Worth keeping. one thing that I love. I should make every prospective student that comes to me and says, I want to be a special effects artist. Because my first question is, well, what do you want to do? Because that's a big, a big field. You know, do you want to be a lab guy? Do you want to be a, an applicator? You know, animatronics? What do you want to do within that field? Because nobody thinks of this glamorous part where you're literally screwing around with spines and flaps and folds for two hours. But this is where the details are. You sure could get it done faster if you hacked it out, but... definitely wouldn't be doing any favors to the to the lineage of Millicent Patrick or Chris Mueller And say you just want to help out, I, I will offer this as well. You can go specifically to the Hearts of Reality or the Give Kids the World and make donations there as well. If you can't attend Gillibration but would like to support what we're trying to do, you could always go there and make a one-time contribution, a donation to Give Kids the World and just earmark Gillibration. <coughs> And that way, you know, they'll know what to do with it. But stuff like that goes in to help for advertising, for promotion, for paying the guests that are going to be coming. All sorts of things like that. Taking that profile down a little bit more. I 
is the idea is we want that to look like just a membrane thin membrane of finny material rather than a thick fleshy bit and again just as I was saying on the other foot that I may or may not want to go back and change a couple of things until it's in in mold you can always change it, so give yourself that time. Okay, I'm liking that a little bit better. It looks more dainty and thin. I don't know what the heck these details would do. Maybe they would act as a water break or something like that if they caught water under them. But I can't interpret that, but I can definitely replicate it. Because obviously they put their thoughts into what it did. Yeah, foot gills. Foot gills. And what's weird, in all the action figures that I've ever seen produced, None of them showed it like this in this detail. much our, our tiered fins there they're done I'm going to move on to this one over here and this is going to be basically the same only it's a much bigger area so we're going to put this this is our continued second little skin there again just smoothing out those lines I remember correctly when I was doing the other side uh, the other foot this was the the pain in the butt side just because of all those little layers and crooks and nannies the other side goes much quicker as does the detail of the top of the toes because that's just anatomical stuff all of the forms are basically there, we just got to do some anatomical corrections and define the lines between the toes for the, the fins. Okay. Amber, our lovely producer for the day, nearly breaking her neck. We're going to create some slight striation in this fin, not too much, but we just don't want it to look like it's just sitting there. And we already have some built in, so I'm just going to put a couple of these little tubes. Sweet, 
but those are not going to appear like spines like these. They're just little tiny mini variations in that fin. So most of that's going to get knocked down as you'll see here. I'm just going to pull it into the details of the fin. I guess that's like some sort of rudder. I don't know. It would have been neat to be in on those meetings, those production and design meetings. I know we can we can throw this out there as far as trivia. We did it on some of our other live broadcasts, but <laughs> not on Facebook. So it's like a new question. Not on huh? Not on YouTube. Not on YouTube. Oops. Yeah. Um, so the trivia question is: What <laughs> was the original original inspiration for the Gilman suit when they first sat down and started dis uh, designing it? What was their first inspiration? We'll give a little time because I know we have a, like a two minute or three minute lag time. But I mean, where would you start? Here's something where you're sitting down, you have the story, the guy that, um, wrote it and brought it to Universal um, evidently was at a dinner party and one of the one of the guys that was present at the movie he was a I believe they said he was a South American um, someone someone within the business but I can't remember what his position was but he was a South American guy and he had told the story of the fish man and that was what gave the writer the idea to do Creature from the Black Lagoon. So, two for one, we got what was the creature modeled after in its original design? And what was the working title before they changed it to Creature from the Black Lagoon? What was the working title of the movie that became the Creature from the Black Lagoon? I bet you RJ will know these. So we're just continuing this detail around. Again, most of these lines that we're putting in here, these striation lines, they're going to disappear by the time we texture it. But it kind of gives a directional flow. I like doing that even when we're doing um, human sculpts because it shows the the lines of wrinkles how a wrinkle would take place in a an individual of a certain age because there is a flow to wrinkles Okay, so now that we have that all roughed in, we have to do our last couple of little spines here. They're like little weird ancillary spines. We have this one that's kind of sticking out the bottom, and that we're going to leave kind of subtle. I'm not go too crazy with that. Are we still in broadcast? It's making noises. Bluetoothing. Okay, we're going to give a little more of a hint here. Not too nuts, but we're going to go a little hint. A 
much more subtle because there's another claw I don't know what it is but in the reference photos that I was able to find there's almost like a inner dew claw up up higher Yeah. Yeah, because we have all of these, and we have this little one that's a dew claw. But then there's this other little weird thing. That's for when he decides to ride a dolphin, he can use it to hook into him, kind of like cowboy boots his spurs. Spurs. <laughs> gonna ride a dolphin. So we're looking right here, if you can catch that in the in the back side of the film here. This little weird flappy claw. And that sleep sweeps slightly backward. Not sure again what it does. Rather reduce it than easier to take away. Yep. Because it is plain, but that's the weird thing. It is kind of flat in all the images that I could find, and there aren't that many, but it appeared to be fairly flat. So that's what we're trying to emulate. So we're looking at probably positioning it, coming off of that back heel, kind of, right around there. Somewhere in there. And then we're going to kind of trim this away. Because we don't want to lose those subforms of whatever bones or tendon is in the ankle. It's that back, that weird little back thing. There are all these weird subforms that are just beautiful when you're looking at them on the original, but you don't know what the heck they were thinking when they designed it. Someone was having a creative day. Yes. Are you done with this one? tapers back slightly towards the heel so it's actually bigger from the front than it is and it follows the line of this lower part here Again, they don't have to be exactly the same, but the obsessive compulsive in me wants them to be as close as I can.
our sound goes away, somebody please let us know. But it says it's picking up the sound, so I'm hoping it just muted it. So it doesn't. Okay. Continue to make weird sounds. I hope that's the Bluetooth. Yeah, the Bluetooth sound. That's what I heard. So right now I'm just blending in those areas around there again. And then jumping back here. said it tapers back in this general area so it's like a part of it in the rear and then as it sweeps back there gets to be a little bit more of a defined line but we will take that down in planes so it looks similar to the other side. thing is that when they're talking in the movie about the uh, evolution that this creature went through throughout time it's pretty controversial of its day I guess What we'll do when it comes to that time is we'll probably... Well, I'm not a real man, so I can't hold my records <laughs> We'll probably uh, take a quick break and come back for the second half of the foot. Because now we're getting pretty darn close to the first half being done. Everything else goes pretty quick, like I said, around the top. So I'm going to get this section done and maybe these three little spines here some of the musculature and then we'll take a break. This is one of our marathon videos. If you've been around for the molding videos, you can know that they go on for quite some time. And like I said, at some point we will edit them down to be a little bit more viewable. Edit out some of the minutiae, because it does take a while. But this is also something you can put on in the background and go about your, di your day and, and check in from time to time. like the idea of this element here coming down into that little spine that's on that one as well so we're just gonna etch that in a little bit
again the constant reductive and then ad additive sculpting I'd like to say like what uh, Bob Ross says you know oh it's your world you're creating it it's a happy little thing and no no errors no accidents but there can be when you're designing something from scratch yeah it's your design but when you're trying to emulate someone else's intent it has to be pretty accurate to it there can be an accident it's not always a happy one So we have all of our subforms in there. Um, these little necks and stuff that you can see on this other side, they're just like injuries or something like that. They're just, they don't have to be in a certain place. But I was thinking maybe like it's where it had rips or something like that in the in the fins. That's that's I could see them on the the original sculpt, but that's something that you can just nick in doesn't have to be perfect maybe they were injuries where he caught it on something or battle with an alligator or something I think in South America it might be a cannon. yeah okay so we have that this little thing is like the beginning <laughs> of the spine we'll define when we get a little bit closer around there Finally, these three things before the break, they're just a continuation of the spines that you see here. We have them marked out where we're going to put them. These will go pretty quick. And we've got all our subforms already worked in here, the claw down here. All of this is basically worked in. So we have our longest one here. And all of these kind of swoop back. So we have our first one. Boom. Second one is going to go in about here. third and final one going about here <coughs> and again for the symmetry I guess it's an aerodynamics or something but this one seemed to slope towards kind of like that Hydrodynamics, yes. Because he wasn't going anywhere fast out of the water. We're going to just, again, because the undercuts, we're going to support this back here. And we're going to push this so there's no gap under that little spine. Got to build that up carefully. Otherwise, when we cast that It'll be hard to get latex into that little spine, but it'll also act as a locking point, and we don't want that. So it's best to build it up slowly. As you're building up that back area. Sometimes if you have to, if you don't have the um, 
the actual item that you're trying to mirror with you or sometimes it's just good to have other reference photos you can actually take a picture of the say in this case the right boot print it out and then just sculpt it in reverse you know you have several different Photoshop and all those different things that you can mirror images and sometimes it's easier to do that especially if you're just getting started it's easier to do that than um, you know trying to sculpt a mirrored image by looking at it <coughs> okay we're going to flatten this out here And then as we can see on the other side, this area is just blended. Almost like this one is very similar to that, just a little bit slightly different. But that, that ridge, that spine is definitely backward facing on this one. Okay, and for the second one, this is a more subtle break, but you can still tell that there's a spine there. We do have to block up behind that again, because otherwise we're going to get a, an undercut. So we're just going to block in the very bottom of that and then blend it into the remaining spine. And as we sp spot that in, this one is more of the same. Again, we're just going to pull and draw that. And as we're blending that edge, we're also pushing and pulling that clay so it follows that spine. Finally, the front, front area here. Add a little bit more bulk to that top area, mainly so I can pull it up a little bit higher. I also want to increase the mass on the inside because it's getting a little bit too deep and we're going past the, the base flesh of the ankle there.
<laughs> we'll eventually have to clean up this area in here because there has to be a form over function what is going on with this ankle or this tendon and how it relates to those other spines it just adds to the aesthetic as well that there's something going on there that looks like it could be anatomical and it definitely helps when you're doing something like this study study still life study real life look at you know how dogs <laughs> tendons are or look up pictures of alligators or things like that that would have visible tendons and how the different thickness of the skin kind of relates to it Finally, we just have to bring this spine to the top. We just got to blend that in a little bit more. <coughs> now so we have the depth, and certainly one depth, but we need to make sure that we have the high points as well. out that top part of that spine or shaft or whatever it is.
probably something on the outside of the workshop. Don't freak out. Don't freak out. You will survive, I promise. Okay, I'm just extending this front one. natural join I guess for his fin there. Kind of shape that angle of that crest just by pushing the clay and pulling it with your fingers. And then again, this is going to get blended. We won't have so much height up there. So we've got those basically roughed in. Those will further be refined once we start doing our our scratching technique and our wrinkling. So what we've basically done again is we finished this area here. We still need to refine all of the toes, but we started working our anatomy back this way. Um, when we come back from the break, we're going to take a short break here. We will continue on with the heel and the other side and then probably wrap up with the... Uh, the toes in this area here because all this needs to be refined and lined to match up with that other side so I figured we would spend a lot of time on this and we did um, this side will go much easier and quicker over here because it does have some of those spines but nowhere <coughs> near what we have as far as intricacy because you can see they're much further set on this side than the other side so when we come back from the break um, probably be about an hour or so we'll get on with the other side and uh, if you have any questions start uh, writing them down or thinking about what you want to ask and we will handle those when we come back and uh, share the video please share the video if you can um, and invite friends to subscribe to them to the channel as well because uh, again that helps us out with our sponsors and subscribers the numbers look good for people that want to help us out so Anyway, thank you again for watching this installment, and we'll be back in about an hour.